Welcome to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Lace up those boots and sling on the pack for a romp through trails, short and long. With your host and renaissance man, Doc, it's time to embrace the suck. Welcome back to another week on the trail, dirtbags and hiker trash. I'm Doc, and this is the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Let's start off with a reminder. If you are enjoying the podcast, take just a minute to help us out. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. All right. <laughs> this week, we are taking a little trip down an alternate branch of the outdoor adventure tree, and we are heading to the high seas. For a while yeah, now, right. I've been looking for a sailor to come on and share some stories. And boy, have I found the right guy for this episode. Welcome to the John Freaking Muir Pod, Robert Phillips. How's it going, Rob? Great, great, big preamble. Uh, pretty average sailor trying to make it on a big ocean. <laughs> yeah, I try and set the stage for our listeners. I, I really want to set their expectations appropriately. And so, I mean, you are the man for this episode. Don't let don't let us down. Okay, <laughs> big boots to fill here. Big boots. <laughs> now. It, the, Primarily, we talk to a lot of through hikers on this podcast, a lot of mm -hmm. people who live in the outdoors, on the trail, out in the woods, living in the dirt. And in, in America, there is a tradition of handing out trail names. Is there a similar phenomenon with sailing? Have you picked up a nickname, a, a, uh, a sailing name, or is that, is, that just, is that just ridiculous? No, absolutely. We, uh, we do this because when you're working on boats and captaining different boats, you know, you change boats pretty frequently. So we all use VHF radios to communicate. And on the working channel, you want to be able to get hold of your friends and things while still sounding semi-official. So you're kind of a awarded a name at some point after doing usually something a little silly. Uh, but mine is Jackie Chan. Decky, as in D-E-C-K-I-E, Decky Chan? Uh, Jackie Chan, as in Rush Hour, one, two, and three. Oh, got it. Got it. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking of, of, of the boating term, you know, deckhand, decky. Decky Chan. No, uh, it kind of works too. I kind of like that though. Yeah, it uh, it's it's pretty funny. Everyone's got some. Some are PG thirteen, some are rated R. But when you get a really official call on the radio, like Jackie Chan, Jackie Chan, we got a big boat looking for a little slip. Can you help us out? It's, nice. uh, now you have to you have to share, of course, time. the story of how you came by the the sailing name Jackie Chan. Why why did they give you that name? Oh, uh, definitely due to my athletic abilities. Uh, it was it was docking a boat in Greece on a beautiful summer day, and uh, we had this this big group of clientele, um, pretty wealthy. One of them owned a few yachts. You know, his last name was Chan, Mister Chan, and he wanted to help in the docking process and feel like he was part of it all. And of course, I'm going to facilitate that. I like, come on, grab a rope, we'll get you the back of the boat. And this was a decent sized boat, and there was a bit of cross breeze which makes docking pretty hard in, in that part of the world because as you're reversing into the dock, you're also dropping your anchor. That's what holds you off the dock. And then as you get close to the dock, you throw a line to a, a dock worker who's going to catch that for you and help secure your boat. And when you have a cross breeze, you know, it's blowing perpendicular to the, the way you're trying to park, that's trying to blow you off. And you could potentially hit another yacht, cause some damage, and most importantly, look like a complete idiot in the spectator sport of docking boats. So Mr. Chan's back there in his glorious 80 years, and he's ready to throw this line. And he goes to throw it, and he holds on to the line, and he just falls off the back of the boat. And we're coming up to a cement wall doing three or four knots, bit of a bit of a spicy docking and a heavy wind. And there's this moment at the controls where I look around and I'm like, okay, well, if we put it in forward, he's going to lose his legs. If I do nothing, we're going to lose him. And I look back at, you know, the, kind of my first mate who's just standing there looking stunned. So I just left the controls, dove to the back of the boat, ripped him out of the water just before the boat collided with the wall and did a bunch of fiberglass damage. And Smokes. the tip wasn't even that great that week. <laughs> You saved the guy's life, and he did not give you a, a generous tip? No, but he, he gave me something that will last longer, and that's the name of Jackie Chan. You know, he'll be, be right there in my epitaph. Fantastic. And is it still your practice to allow uh, customers to participate in the docking procedure of your of your yacht? 
Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, if you want to sink your teeth into any part of being on a boat, however sketchy that is, um, I say get into it. You know, it's it's one of these really fun things, yachting and sailing and racing, where there's so many different aspects to it and they're all really interesting. And you only get a feel for what it is to be part of it if you if you grab onto things and do stuff. So no, that hasn't really um strayed me from trying to get people involved. Cause that's how you get people involved in like the culture and the joy of just being around boats. And possibly losing your legs. That yeah, that too. <laughs> like swimming pretty hard. <laughs> All right. Hey uh Jackie Chan, have you listened to the podcast before? <laughs> Yes, I have. Uh, I've heard a, a, a number of episodes. Um, I spend quite a bit of time in the outback here in Australia, driving around in the truck. And uh, yeah, over the last few weeks, after you got in contact with me, your episodes have been keeping me company out there. Okay, so it's like we're old friends now. <laughs> in a creepy way. I've been staring over the bush, and you're, you're just noticing I'm looking at <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so I only ask because I want to make sure that you are aware that we have a segment towards the end of the episode called the Pro Tip Inside of the Week, and that's where you're going to share some of your, usually it's trail wisdom, but it's going to be your your outdoor adventure wisdom, what you've learned from your mistakes that's going to help our listeners have a better experience next time they're out on the trail. Okay, pressure's on. Pressure's on. Pressure's on. The Must Bring Gear Review. All right, Jackie Chan. Another feature we've been doing this season is the Must Bring Gear Review, sponsored by the Ultralight Backpacking Gear Company, Six Moon Designs. Here's how it works. If you were to let, your, let a stranger pack your bag with pretty much generic gear for a multi-day adventure on the high seas, what is the one specific piece of gear you would insist on being packed? And if you've got a particular brand for that specific piece of gear, even better. So, Rob, when you're out there, captaining your yacht what what is it you have to have out there a multi-tool i could have nothing else but a multi-tool strap to me and you can kind of make it happen out there uh it's a leatherman uh usually one of the black ones they they resist rust and corrosion a little more but that thing saves lives day in and day out and it's usually when a problem happens it happens pretty quick especially when you're in a racy and windy setting you know, a sail is going to blow, a shackle is going to explode, something's going to happen, and you just need a pair of pliers at your hip to grab onto it and start fixing. And it's it's always there. You know, I, I, I go to bed with the thing strapped to me in a boat, especially if I'm racing. Um, but, yeah, without a doubt, a Leatherman. And that's, like, kind of trickled into my everyday life. Like, in my nightstand, there's a Leatherman. Under the seat of my motorcycle, there's a Leatherman. <laughs> and then it's okay to lose them because they just keep reappearing. You got one stashed in your sock. <laughs> I'm ready to go at all times. Now you mentioned rust and corrosion. You know, the ocean air, very corrosive, right? And so yeah. I imagine there's a lot of maintenance that has to go on with your yacht to, to keep it in good condition. Um it's it's really never ending on a boat. Um, you know, everything has a work cycle, everything has a maintenance cycle, and it's it's always something you're trying to stay ahead of. And conditions dictate that a little bit, especially if you're if you're racing. You know, if you're in the middle of the ocean in a hurricane, things are still going to go wrong, and things are still going to hit their, you know, their maintenance intervals. And you're never in a position where you can ignore that because these things are are pieces of kit that are going to save your life. So, this is one of the big problems with a boat is that they're always trying to sink. You know, you leave it's like a kid. If you if you leave it alone alone for too long, it's just going to you know keel over. <laughs> literally in this case but between, you know, i you know, wish i would sales. have known that i wish i would have known that before i started parenting 27 years ago <laughs> now, that that is a pro tip right there parenting pro tip <laughs> right there from, from rob <laughs> phillips do not leave the kids on their own I, I mean i'm i'm just guessing i don't have any kids the closest thing i've had is a boat but if you leave it it's going to fall apart and that's maintenance with sails fiberglass winds instruments computers sat comms you know, very software packages, plumbing, autopilot rams, all kinds of stuff. And you're just, whatever your situation is, you got to keep maintaining them because they're always working for you. And if they stop, you're, you can be in a bit of a pickle. Yeah. I've been told that, that the, the best thing is not to own a boat, but to be good friends with somebody who owns a boat <laughs> because of the amount Absolutely. of work and money that goes into them. 
Yeah. They say there's, there's two great days in a boat owner's life or, you know, in owning a boat and it's the day you buy the boat and then the day you sell the boat. And especially with a sailboat, I mean, that you can equate it to being in a closet while somebody's throwing cold buckets of water at you and you're trying to burn your money. That's, well, uh, like that. that's a pretty tough I like tale. that. That That is a great visual. <laughs> that's nice. Now, my sister, my sister and her husband live in a boatyard in Mexico. And they've been, oh, cool. they've been restoring and working on their boat for the last, I don't know, it seems like three years. I don't think yeah. the thing, I don't think the thing has touched water in three years. And I ask all the time, you know, is it really a boat if it's not, you know, if it hasn't touched water <laughs> in that long? But it's it, a caravan through, at this point. Yeah. Painstakingly and just replacing, repairing, changing things out, um, which brings up another question. If you change out every piece on a boat, is it the same boat? If the hull's the same, you know, if you, if you restore, uh, they've, you know, re you... they've replaced sections of the hull. I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't know if, if it's the entire hull, but I think it's, it's sections, got the same soul. It's got the same spirit. It's probably okay. got the same name on the back and you can, you can buy hurricane boats, boats that have been sunk and written off by insurance where you have to put it on the heart and then spend years kind of piecing it back together. But it's a way to get in to sailing and having a boat without dropping that crazy chunk of change on something brand new if you're handy and you like engineering things and taking things apart and putting it back together it's it's a pretty incredible feeling to to go through that doing doing a refit on your own yeah there's my sister down there with her husband doing all kinds of welding and painting and scraping and whatever else i mean she's she's very uh very good with her hands and uh, and so is he and it's only i think it's 300 dollars a month to live in the boatyard Oh, that's nothing. Yeah, you yeah, couldn't get yeah. that in the States. Almost like nowhere near. Yeah. Do you know what kind of, is it a sailboat? It's not a sailboat. I think it's powerboat. I think. Oh, I, could, I could be totally wrong. I've only yeah. seen bits and pieces of it. So on, a, a on project a like that, the amount that you learn going through that, you know, you've got YouTube, you've got some friends around the boatyard, but, it, you know, if you don't have a huge timeline, couple hundred bucks a month or a year to stay there you can just sink your teeth into it and figure it out that's yeah that's, right. that's all any sailors out there doing it's just <laughs> we're all trying to figure it out all right let's move to the next segment it's the hiking pole the hiking pole and that is pole spelled p-o-l-l -L, like a survey not the thing that you hold in your hands out there on the on the trail and this is a seven question survey that's going to allow me to give you a ranking on the sanity scale between one and a hundred with one being completely insane and 100 being completely sane. Okay. Now there is an automatic 20 point deduction for anybody who has sailed in the North Atlantic. Have you sailed in the North, North Atlantic? Uh, is it 20 points for each time? <laughs> Just overall. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a 20 point deduction there. Crossed it a few times. Because the North Atlantic is home to some of the like the worst weather on the planet, right? And it's freezing cold, and puffins aren't as cute as the Discovery Channel wants you to think. If you've ever been attacked by a puffin off the coast of Newfoundland at night, you'll know it's not a friendly space out there. Attacked? Attacked yeah, by puffins? I'd, I'd call it... I mean, I think it would go down as manslaughter the way it came at me. Luckily, I survived. I don't think it would have been murder one. But yeah, off the coast of Newfoundland, we just left. We were sailing across from Newfoundland to Ireland in the middle of winter for some reason on this boat called an Open 60. Um, these are the Volvo Ocean Race boats. So they're designed to be run by, you know, 12-ish crew, but they've got no external protection. You're just in the open and you're out. All the elements you kind of, you just take on the face. You're wearing a, a lot of waterproof kit, but it's... It's pretty grueling, especially up there in the North Atlantic and the Labrador Current, where it's just icy cold. And it's a foggy night. We're sailing along. We just left Glacier Bay. And sure enough, you hear this. Doof, <laughs> pop. And I look down and a puffin has landed at my feet after hitting the sail and zinging down. And I'm holding the wheel with one hand. I'd been violently seasick because it was just so foggy. There was no bearing. So I'd been throwing up off the side of the boat holding onto the wheel with one hand, trying to keep it straight. And this puffin lands by me. And you do the nice thing. You bend over, you try to pick the puffin up. But I didn't realize these things have claws specifically designed for tearing flesh apart. 
and it didn't take kindly to my act of service. <laughs> it tore into my hands and just like a live grenade, I pitched this thing off the side of the boat. <laughs> And then I'm bleeding everywhere. I'm throwing up. I'm steering this boat. I'm getting hit by waves. And nobody wants to believe me that I just got attacked by a puffin. They're all laughing at me. <laughs> definitely nobody a moment. Actually saw, nobody actually saw that happen. So your your account was under suspicion. The, the captain of the boat came up the stairs as he heard me screaming. And then just started laughing at me. <laughs> now, did the puffin take flight when you threw it or did it just do, you know, it, it was still stunned and it's now at the bottom of, of the, the Atlantic? I like to think that puffin took flight. It was too windy and foggy to really know, but it didn't want to stick around. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to keep it there. Wow. We've already gotten two great stories right off the top here. And we're, we're just barely into this. This is this is going to be good. All right. So I've got yeah. a question for you, Rob. Typically, I ask seven questions related to hiking. Mm -hmm. We can go that route if you have any hiking experience, or we could go with the second set of questions that really apply to you know some of the big life issues that we're struggling with as a society right now. Well, we can go either way. I've done, I'd say my, my job for about 10 years has been hiking, and it's it's vastly different from through hiking. You know, it doesn't take that amount of grit and determination. It's, you know, I've spent years looking for gold in the wilderness where a helicopter just drops you off on a ridge line, and your goal is to get to that other peak in a few days so they can pick you up. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I mean, this, I think you'd qualify then. I mean, you, you, you're spending the okay. nights out there in the outback or out in, out in the, in the back country. So I think I, I think I can ask you, ask you these questions and you'll, you'll have some answers for us. All right. All right. First question. And again, scale one to a hundred, your top score is 80. Because you've been in the North Atlantic, and I, I score you according to whether or not I agree with you or just you know how I feel tonight. So, you know, there's no rhyme. Or <laughs> just just do your best. Don't try and answer how you think I want to hear. Let's just hear the truth from you. All right. Question number one: Trekking poles or no trekking poles out there? Oof, um, I've used ice picks a lot. Generally, I'll go out with one ice pick if I'm in the high alpine. I've gotten close to a trekking pole. I know there's this, I can't remember who makes it. There's one where it's an ice pick and it's got an extendable trekking pole that comes off the bottom. But typically, no, ice picks as far as I'll go because you're we're usually in such steep terrain that uh, you'll just trip over a trekking pole. All right. Now, similar to the the convention of assigning a, a hiker a, a trail name because of something funny that's said or done, I also look... I'm always on the lookout for a trail name for the episode that we're recording. I'm looking for something funny that happens during the episode. And I think okay. the, the title of this episode might be, I've gotten close to a trekking pole. I, I've never <laughs> heard it phrased quite like that. that that's good. That's good. Yeah. We, we exchanged a, a glance, a fierce gaze, and then kept going on my way. A fierce gaze. All right. Question number two, what's on your feet, boots or trail runners? Oh, boots. It's always boots. Uh, and yeah, depending on the terrain, a couple different versions of boots. But yeah, I feel so naked in trail runners. I'm barefoot or boots. There's no in between. One extreme or the other. What 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 uh, brand of boots do you prefer? If I'm doing some pretty casual hiking, like if I don't need a shank and any kind of like picks on my toes, it's a solos. A solos have gotten me to so many places. There's like a TPS five something and I'm finding them harder and harder to find in North American stores. So I've had to import them a couple of times and they, it's like this beautiful little leather glove and it's got a, you know, a couple layers of Gore-Tex inside and you can treat them like crap. You, you know, I rarely oil them. They always stay dry. They're super light. That's, that's my only boot, you know, and I'll go through, every three or four years i might need to replace them and that's it's a hard three or four years on them okay yeah now what kind of distances are you hiking when you're out there um ooh. you know if i can cover depending on the line we've picked if i can cover 20k in a day i'm pretty happy yeah, sometimes we'll, for us for us americans that'd be 12 miles ooh. Okay, so the six feet in a fathom. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I think 10 to 15 miles. Okay. And it, it all depends on how we set up the day. In the morning, you wake up with a helicopter pilot, you have a, a coffee and you stare at some really low resolution map and you go, okay, we think we can get from here to here. And you go out and try it. And if it's, you know, kind of a long topography, then you can do pretty well. But as soon as you get into straight verticals, it's, you're just grinding. Hey, Rob, why don't you have the helicopter pilot just fly you to your final destination? Why do you, why does he drop you off and then you get to walk 15 miles? That doesn't make any sense. Because all the gold is where nobody's ever been. You know, we're out there looking for treasure. We got to, we got to break our own trails, wrestle our own grizzly bears and see what's going on. So a, a big thing of what we're doing on these expeditions is is mapping the rocks as we go to kind of compile a big scientific model of the region we're looking at. So it's hiking with a lot of pauses. You know, you just, every time you stumble into a cliff or a rock, it's, ooh, what's that? And you spend a while talking to it and exchanging notes with the rock and then carry on to the next one. It's like hiking with my daughter. Lots of stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> lots of stops, lots of snacks. And if you time it just right before your helicopter pick up, a good nap with a view. Nice. All right, question number three. W what is your shelter system out there? Do you use a tent, tarp, hammock, bivy, or do you cowboy camp? If we're doing a multi-day helicopter-supported expedition, it's usually cowboy camping. Um. Because in the high alpine, if we have bad weather, we're just not going to do it because you're going to get a mix of hot, freezing rain, snow. But if we have a few clear nights ahead of us, then we'll just cowboy camp. If I'm out there hiking around on my own, um, then I'm always in a hammock. I love sleeping in hammocks. It feels like a cheat code. It's this tiny little ball that just ends up being this cocoon that you can sleep in. If it's cold, you bring a little, um, like a self-inflating air mattress kind of keep your butt warm and keep the skeeters off you but they're they're fantastic yeah i always seem to take good naps in hammocks but i can never get a good night's sleep in one i don't know what it is there's I, oh i can't remember the brand off the top of my head but there's there's some that are really asymmetrical so you can get perfectly flat the the only trouble is if you've had a few beers in camp and you come into that hammock a little too hot it spits you right back out <laughs> <laughs> That would probably be a problem for me then. Yeah. Now, Rob, I'm catching a little bit of, is that, is that a Canadian accent? Sure is, bud. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm from a couple hours north of Toronto. Just a little hay farm in town with not much other to do than play hockey and fish. Nice. Did but you grow up I think playing like, hockey? I did. Yeah. As soon as we could walk. Um, we're usually given a pair of skates from the government. <laughs> it's not that bad, but I think my mom wanted a daughter. So she gave me figure skates <laughs> I was into figure skating for a couple of years while I begged and begged to, to play hockey with all my friends. And then eventually got there, I think around seven or eight and you're, you're so small. So the contact doesn't do much with you, but I specifically remember my dad in place of shin pads, we couldn't afford duct taping magazines to my legs. <laughs> Instead of me out on the ice, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of just, it's part of life. It's, it's great. You play on the pond, you, you, you play on the rink and it's kind of a way to connect with friends in a rural community. And it, you know, you tour all the other towns and play against them as it gets more competitive. Yeah. You probably want like a cosmopolitan magazine, Cosmo, rather than like, Mad magazine. <laughs> you want the thicker, the thicker type yeah. magazines to protect those shins. Yeah. Yeah, Cosmo is definitely the way to go out there. <laughs> give, you something, give you something to read between every period, too. <laughs> when you're in the penalty box. Now, how many of your figure skating partners did you have to, to cross-check or hip-check before your, your mom finally caught on that that was not the sport for you? No, there was no no partners. Um, <laughs> I can't remember doing any kind of competitions with it. Uh, but it was, I, I think uh, my mom's this very gentle English woman just... You know, anything contact related was terrifying to her. And then, you know, you look at why Canadians are so calm most of the time. And it's because they're either beating each other up on the hockey rink or beating each other up on the lacrosse pitch. And then the rest of the time, everyone's so, so relaxed. That's right. You get it out. You, that's why yeah. referees don't break up the hockey fights. You let them get it out. They get it out. The rest of the game's going to be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
Let's see. Question number four, I think we're on. Uh, when it comes to your sleep system, are you a sleeping bag guy or a quilt guy? Oh, sleeping bag. I didn't know quilts were options. Oh, really? Yeah. Let me, Is this let a, me, like let a, a big hiker that, thing? Let me mark that down. Hang on. Yeah, quilts. Quilts are 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 pretty awesome. They're light, uh, but they're you know depending on what degree rating you get. I mean, they keep you nice and warm. Really? Okay, so this has got to be a lot more advanced than I'm picturing grandma's quilt. Yes. Yeah. Not. This is not your grandmother's quilt. That's for sure. <laughs> Taking the big patchwork quilt like a like a cloak down the trail. <laughs> Yeah, I see. I, I understand now the the look of surprise and curiosity yeah. on your face when I ask that question. Now, Ooh, I'll have to look into this because um, yeah. sailing. I mean, we we have to go sleeping bags because you need a waterproof system. Uh, when you're on race boats, everything's wet and damp all the time. But there's a couple. There's two companies that make these waterproof sleeping bags. They're heavy. The things like ten kilograms. But it's got layers and layers of microfiber and fleece and then a really, really thick, heavy Gore-Tex outer layer. And it's incredible. You'll get in there in your wet undies, zip up, you'll come out dry and toasty warm. It's it's great. You just stuff your wet clothes at the bottom and jump in with it. Your body heat seems to dry everything out. And then you just you roll it up and tie it up before you get out. And it becomes your one place of salvation on a wet racing boat. Nice. Great. Great for a wet racing boat. Not so great for a through hike of the PCT. <laughs> No, I know. <laughs> <It'd be a laughs> <bit> heavy. <laughs> All right. Question number five. When you're out there uh in the backcountry doing doing your hike, when it comes to food, do you use stove, cold soak, or stoveless? Uh I usually have a jet coil. Okay. I'm I'm such a sucker for that that hot cup of tea or hot cup of coffee in the morning. Watching sunrise from a mountain peak while sipping on that is just yeah. I mean that's the only reason I go out into the woods is to sip on tea in nicer places. It's absolutely amazing. I thought it was to find gold. Oh, that's that's just what we tell the people I work for. Got it. <laughs> All right. Question number six. Is life better above or below the tree line? If I'm hiking, I, I love it above. There's less bugs. There's less bears. There's less brush. The incredible vistas. You know, if, if you get hiking around in the high alpine surrounded by ice fields in the Rocky Mountains, it's like nothing. It's another world. It's, you know, you, you can't go through a day being frustrated or negative when you have that kind of environment around you. It's a beautiful place to be. Okay. Now, our last question in the hiking poll, question number seven, what's more important, pack weight or luxury items? Oh, Luxury items. And if we were looking to your bag, sure. Rob, what uh, what luxury items might we find? Uh, you'd find an AeroPress. You'd find a jet boil. You'd find some suspiciously snobby coffee. Um, and it's all for that, you know, getting up before sunrise, rolling out of my hammock on a mountain peak, and creating that moment. But these are, I'm, you know, I'm out there for a few days. I think if, if I had to hike months and months that, you know, should China trying to even touch the mindset of a through hiker, that, that stuff would probably all disappear. Okay. Rob, how do you think you did? Solid 70, you know, okay. they all seem to be pretty logical answers. If, if we had the ability to ask your mom how she'd score you on the sanity scale, what, what score would she give you? This gentle English woman. Oh, she, she doesn't get a lot of the things I do. Uh, you know, she loves me either way, but, uh, you know, some adventures don't. She doesn't know about, you know, it's better to tell her afterwards. Understandable. Don't want to, don't want to put that burden on her. Okay. Well, hey, let me do some math. I got to take your answers. I got to put them through the John Freaky Mirpod algorithm. Uh, so I got to carry the two. Boop, 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 boop. We're going to uh, divide that by root three. We're going to multiply uh -huh. by two and we're going to adjust for the blood pressure of someone who's just been attacked by a wild puffin. And I come up with a score of 44, 44, definitely 44. south of the mid, the midpoint. Yeah. South of the equator on that one. For south sure. of the equator. 
I'll take it. Yeah, is that so south of the equator? Is that Tropic of Capricorn or is that is that Tropic of Cancer? I should know this. You, I mean, you're a sailor. I can tell you it's the tropics. <laughs> it, it is the tropics. <laughs> okay. All right, Rob. Before we get too far down the trail or too far, mm -hmm. how would I extend that metaphor to a sailing type of situation? Too far out of out of the harbor. Let's uh, let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about where you grew up. Um, we already talked a little bit about your hobbies and, and sports, but how'd you get involved in the sailing cult? The sailing cult. They took me in from a young age. My my dad is he's an aerospace engineer, and his language. His love language is fixing stuff. And we grew up 3,000 miles from the nearest ocean. There's a reservoir a couple, nearby. A couple hours north of Toronto. That's a big sailing area. <laughs> yeah. The, the Great Lakes is a surprisingly motivated and enthusiastic sailing community. They'll drag their, as soon as the snow melts, they're dragging boats into the water and they're there every day they can be. But we, you know, we, we're a couple hundred miles north of the Great Lakes. But he saw this little boat on the side of the road one day. It's just a, a single person boat. It's called a sunfish. There's not much to them. Just one little pole over the mast, a flimsy little sail. And somebody was giving it away because it had a huge hole in the bottom. So him being the engineer he is, you know, strapped it to the top of his, you know, 80 something Toyota Camry <laughs> and drove it home. And he said, we got a boat. So we kind of hummed and hawed and figured it out and reinforced it and started layering fiberglass and made it watertight. Uh, the mast stood, but it didn't have a boom on it, which is the horizontal support for the sail. So we we made one out of wood and then we got our first sail. It was a shower curtain held on there by shower curtain rings and took this thing out to the reservoir and just started going back and forth. And it, it was, it's interesting for him as a, it was for me and you know we just kind of fell in love with being around the water and it was one of those incredible things where it all just seemed to make sense you know there's there's salt water somewhere in the bloodline and somewhere in my veins and it just kind of worked and through doing that for a bit there was somebody else a little boat out there that said hey why don't you you know get this kid into competitive sailing and from there it was kind of a quick transition to starting racing uh, through sponsorship from a local yacht club and then through sponsorship from like the state racing team and then on to international dinghy racing. And it was, it, it was always a challenge and there was always a ton to learn and you were always around people that were way better than you. And it was just, you could just get into it and it had no end to like how much you could learn and how much you could achieve. And it was kind of freedom in a way, especially coming from this little town, all of a sudden you can get on a boat and you know, your horizon becomes endless. So competitive sailing, how old were you when you entered competitive sailing? Probably 13. By, by 13, 14, the state had like a junior team or like the province in our case had a junior team where you get a bit of funding. They would kind of pay for your, your travel and your transport and move your boat around as long as you could cover um, some of the maintenance and fees for your own boat. Um, that was a slightly upgraded version of the Sunfish at that point. Still a, a one-person boat, but it's that was a single fleet design. So that's where a lot of people really start out. And even at the highest level, when you look at things like the, I'd say the biggest race on the planet, the Volvo Ocean Race, where you look at some of the sail GP stuff, which is a little more short course, really fast. They're all one design boats. So it becomes about the competitor. And how you can use the advantages that the weather gives you and your understanding of the water and the wind to win. So it's it's a really neat space. It's, it's chess in a way. So how long were the races in competitive boat racing when you were 13? These ones, they're not that long. You kind of like around the cans kind of thing. They'll set up a <clears throat> sausage or a triangle and you go, you go around that a set number of times in a set formation. So three, four miles. And you'll do three or four of those in a day. And how did young Master Phillips uh, fare out there? Well, two, two different ways, really well or really bad. And if the wind was light and it came down to making a lot of smart tactical decisions, reading like slight puffs of wind or slight oscillations in current, I'd do terrible. But I thought that was, if, I thought that was going the other direction. <laughs> I thought that was going the other direction completely. No, but if, 
if it was just a really heavy wind day where all you had to do was lean out over the boat, work your tail off to try and keep it flat and force this thing through the waves, I'd dominate every single time. And I think that theme has that theme of stubbornness in my life have really, has really stuck stuck around. Where it's, if there's something to be done and it involves just putting my head down and grinding through it, I, I can get there. Okay. Hey, we're going to take a short break. We're going to hear from the sponsors. We're going to come back and we're going to get out to some adventures on the high seas. And I think you've also got some, some backcountry stories as well. So stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. And welcome back. We're talking to Rob Phillips, a.k.a. Jackie Chan. <laughs> what a great sailing name, Jackie Chan. Um, we heard a little bit about your background growing up. Have you ever spent any time on a like a mega yacht? I most certainly have. You um, have? Mega yachts are very different from the, the mini yachts, I guess we were talking about before. They're a little more industrial, uh, a little more posh. It attracts a slightly different type of person that sometimes is a little more motivated by image or um, the money you can make in the industry. But I, uh, I have done a lengthy six days on a mega yacht and... You know, thankfully, somebody was around to record every second of every minute for the entire affair. <laughs> it's uh, a TV show, which might be sewering the whole industry, <laughs> called Below Deck. Below Deck, which season were you on? Oh, I think it was eight. To I haven't seen, I've, I've never seen any episode of any season including mine. Um, I just, I can't bring myself to do it. <laughs> it's out there somewhere. Um, I can't tell you how it, how it turned out. Well, Jackie Chan and my, my faithful listeners, I have a confession to make. Uh, my wife and I have gone down the rabbit hole of below deck. Oh, I'm so, yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw, we saw your season it was season eight and you, you had mentioned that you had done some of these other types of activities. And I thought, you know, I'm going to reach out. We'll just take a flyer. See, see if, see if he is willing to come on and talk about some of his adventures and lo and behold, here you are. So, well, that's great. This is something really positive that came of it. So that's a, that's a huge win. There you go. But I also uh, want to ask on, on the mega yachts, do, does, does Captain Sandy or Captain Lee, do they, they let the guests take part in the docking procedures? No, the, the docking procedure on that boat, I can't remember the name of the boat. It was one of Captain Lee's boats. It's really over dramatized. So they have the whole back of the boat cleared. You know, it'll be a dead calm day. You're approaching the dock at, you know, you know, barely moving speed. There'll be no wind, but somehow like dramatic music is playing. It's all this. If he misses this line, we all die. But they don't mention the boat has thousands of horsepower. It's got its propellers on pods and it's got bow thrusters. So it can move in any direction at any time with a tiny little joystick. In a lot of cases, the bigger the boat, the easier it is to park up to a, a certain size and, you know, with certain variables. But it's, you know, you could have a harder time parking a 40-foot a racing sailboat with no bow thruster than you would a 160-foot super yacht. So no, no guests. And they control the guests really well. It's all, it's all a bit, you know, managed. It's not scripted, is it? Yes and no. There's a set narrative, you know, and they have that, you know, it doesn't matter in some cases what you do or what you say, they will fit your character into that narrative. You know, this, you know, they'll, they'll take something from this interview, this interview, and this moment, and somehow I'll make it one to fit the storyline that they wanted to tell. You know, sometimes there'll be a scene that they really want to nail. So they'll ask people to act out the scene a few times. They'll, they'll say, we need you to go say this to this person to create this set of drama. And I think the issue they had uh, when I came on is I didn't want any part of that. Um, so I just tell them to piss off and do my own thing, uh, which kind of became part of the fun. You know, there's, there's certain freedoms you get used to when you work in the industry and things that really keep you in the industry. And that's the incredible people, the community, the teamwork and the experiences you get to have. And when you have somebody tell you, you can't step off the boat while you're at the dock because it'll, you know, hurt this part of their filming process. It's hard to agree with that. So sometimes you just steal the golf cart, 
the golf cart and go to the pub. And apparently that doesn't work well with uh, film crews who are trying to make a show. Okay. So I'm glad that you are used to that experience so that you won't be surprised when I cut this up in post-production and make you sound like <laughs> a raving lunatic on the, on, the, on the episode here. Absolutely. All right. So we did talk a little bit about sailing across the North Atlantic and the puffin attacks. Any other, I mean, what, how you said you, you've done this multiple times. How many times have you gone across the North Atlantic and what typically is the, the weather pattern there? Um, I've gone across the North Atlantic twice. I just got back, well, a month or so ago from crossing the Pacific as well. And the, there's trade winds and you kind of, you try to follow those trade winds. So if you're going in the North Atlantic, it's really hard to go straight across because you're going to kind of be going into these spinning low pressure systems. So you got to, you got to go north and then kind of slingshot along the edge of these low pressure systems. And if you're coming from the UK or Europe to the Caribbean, you're going to have to dip south and come across as well. So your, your goal is, especially if you're racing and trying to make good time, is you try to find a, a big hurricane or a big menacing looking low pressure system. And as that thing's spinning, that it's going to have wind bands that, that are fairly predictable. You know, in the center, it's going to be that, you know, the, the eye of the storm and it's really going to ruin your day. But towards the edges, you're going to be able to find that sweet spot of 20 ish knots where the waves are going to be at your stern. So you can get into that, follow the storm, and just be surfing along with your sail set all the way across the ocean if you can. The the record for sailing across the Atlantic, which was hit a few years ago, they did it by hooking up two of these low pressure systems. You know, usually you can just get one, but it's that's and it's the same with the Pacific as well. It's uh, you want to chase storms. It's kind of like slingshotting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. you know you've you've messed it up. Because if the winds just keep increasing and increasing and increasing, you're going, oh, okay, the models are wrong. So you have a really strong signal of, okay, let's bear off and get out of the center of this thing. And you get weather data every every 6 to 12 hours, you'll get an accurate set of weather data. You'll download these files, you'll bring them into your computer software and build a predictive model for it. So with that, you can pretty accurately tell what's going to happen, you know, one, two, three days out, and then, and then make your plans accordingly. Right now, when you crossed the Atlantic twice and the Pacific, was this as part of a, a racing team? Yes, the, the the Pacific one was. That one was just part of. It was a leg of a race around the world, so it's called the Globe Forty. They took these boats called Class Forties, which were initially designed for a race that goes from France to the Caribbean, which is really a, a downwind ride. So they're a flat planing hull. Lots of sail area, super high horsepower. And once you get them dialed in, it's like this, you know, transcendent experience. You're just surfing and punching through waves and flying along. But it becomes much more challenging when you take this thing around the world where you're not going to be sailing downwind 100% of the time. You can be sailing upwind, you know, 40, 50% of the time. And you have this really thin fiberglass hull that's kind of like a drum and you're inside it smashing into the wind. So it's, if you can imagine being in a metal garbage can while somebody's beating it with a bat, that's that's kind of the experience of going upwind in these things. And that's what we just did across the Pacific. That race just finished a couple of days ago. Um, the winners, this incredible Dutch team, actually had an older version of the boat. And this is a one-class design. It's been around for 10 years or so. And they kind of like F1, where they update the rules every few years to allow some new... They have some really interesting new pieces of engineering to be adapted to it. The team that won had one of the oldest boats, interestingly enough, which was the slowest boat downwind, but the most efficient boat upwind and the most sturdy boat. And they, they just won the whole thing. So they made up ground on the upwind portions of the race then. Yeah. And, and very Actually, smart is it making, sailors. Is it making up ground is probably making up water, right? I mean, you don't, I'm, mix, I'm mixing my metaphors again. I don't know. I usually lose ground out there. So I'd say making up ground <laughs> for sure. All right. All right. Now, when you're on a through hike, I mean, there's a very mm. simplicity of of purpose and function out there. I mean, you're you're mm -hmm. getting up, you're breaking camp, you're you're having something to eat, you're walking, you're setting up camp, and you're eating and you're going to sleep, and then you do it over and over again. You do if you do that enough times, you can go, you know, twenty six hundred mm. miles or further. Um, what is a typical day like in in the life of a 
a sailboat racer. And, w- and what was your role on the boat? This, the one we just finished, that was um, a shorthanded race. So there's two of us. So at any one time, there's only ever really one person managing the boat. And shorthanded racing creates this interesting challenge where sleep becomes one of your big resources. Because if you sleep too much, you're not making good decisions. If you don't sleep enough, you're making bad decisions. And you've got two people in that. So you're really trying to find this balance of teamwork and rest and nutrition where you can manage the boat in these really challenging environments. But you find a rhythm. And it's the first 24 hours, I find there's really not much sleep. Because there's the adrenaline of the start, you know, especially in a staged race. You know, let's say you sail from Africa to Australia, then you're going to have two weeks to get the boat ready to do the next leg of the race, you know, across the other side of the world. So in that two weeks, you're you're going 14, 15 hours a day, making sure the boat's ready. And you're really dedicated to this because if the boat doesn't work, it puts you in a pretty precarious situation and you're definitely not going to win the race or have a chance at it. And then you've got all that kind of pressure. You get to the start line, then there's the excitement of starting this race. You know, you're pointing your bow offshore to an empty horizon. And it's that in itself is this incredible moment where it's it's this unknown, but it's the same horizon our sailing ancestors have seen for thousands of years. You're you're getting into it, going out to the, the biggest race course on the planet with the most variables of any race course on the planet. And you're all that. And then all of a sudden you're racing and it's okay. Single-minded win. So the first 24 hours or so you're trying to establish your position in the fleet. And if you can get out front, then you can start to relax. You want to push, 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 keep everything, push it to its limit. And then you can kind of relax a bit. So once you're through that, then you establish a rhythm that works with the crew. Some people do set shifts. So that'll be, you know, let's say three hours on three hours off. So you're three hours on, you must be up and active within that three-hour period, managing the boat, the weather, doing repairs, sail changes, the whole thing. You're three hours off. That's where you eat, sleep, hydrate, whatever you got to do. And that's, I work better in a set shift. Some, Some established teams out there, they do more of this dynamic shift where they'll sleep as long as they need to. And then wake up and, you know, a guy will have a six hour sleep and then swap over and then they'll kind of do that throughout the day, whatever makes more sense, depending on the weather and the time. But once you're in a rhythm, it's, you know, you're, you don't, I find, I like to work where I don't set an alarm. The the awake person sets the alarm. So you just feel this cold, damp hand shake you (laughs) through your sleeping bag and you kind of come to, and you usually come out of a really deep sleep because you're you're always in a state of exhaustion and the boats bucking and flying through the waves, you know, it gets to the point where half the boats flying out of the wave and then piercing into another and really abruptly stopping before you start surfing down the next. So you come out of a deep sleep filled with wild dreams that kind of reflect the state the boats moving. And it takes about five minutes to realize what planet you're on and what you're doing with your life and confront all your life decisions. (laughs) And then, start to put on your cold wet sailing gear um because there's no option you you know that person is absolutely spent after their shift and you got to get out you're in the middle of the ocean there's no way out of this but getting through and then you just kind of repeat this three hours on three hours off and it's a lot of grind and in that grind there's incredible moments and i'm sure this is something with through hiking where a lot of it's just, it's it's hard work and it's pushing and it's developing grit and tenacity to where you can have these transformative moments of just everything makes sense, like that that ultimate clarity. Rob, but, I've got a lot to unpack right there. We, we covered sorry. a lot of ground or we covered a lot of water, covered a lot of something. And I've got, I've I get got really, questions. I've got questions and I've got highlights to point out here. First- I get really so, excited about sailing. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Now- Someone who's on, who, someone who's working on a boat, also referred mm-hmm. to as a hand, right? Depending on what could be a they're deck doing, hand. could be yeah, could, but, but yeah, entry that, level. That, that's not an unfamiliar term. Hand. That's not an unfamiliar term for a boat. So when you say that you were aw- awakened by a cold, wet hand, I mean a cold, wet hand. That's another candidate right there 
for the episode title, <laughs> a cold, wet hand. That could refer to you, right? I mean, in certain instances. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, that's just, you know, on the shorthanded race, it's a co-captain. And that's right. literally them soaking wet, coming off deck, trying to shake you into reality. Don't, don't get technical on me. I made, I made a good point. So <laughs> let's leave it at that. Great point. Yeah. And the other thing is I have to confess that when I read through the notes here as we're getting ready and it says racing across the Pacific shorthanded on a 40 foot boat, you know, what comes to mind is I think somebody just fell in the water and instead of having like four people, you had three people right. or instead of having three, you had yeah. two. I didn't realize that was the purpose. That's like the, kind of the, the design of the race to have just two people. And that's called shorthanded. Yeah. It, it adds a, a massive challenge to being at sea because you've got, mentally the things you have to push yourself through mm -hmm. which you know you hit that dangerous spot where you start thinking why am i here and there's there's no there's no out like you're not not going to go to town and grab a beer it, you have to keep pushing and then you know you're dealing with physical exhaustion the mental tiredness you're dealing with the relationship with the other partner and you're trying to race at you know a really high level and push a boat to its absolute limit in all this so this is where I've kind of heard said that it's the hardware is always going to take it and that the hardware is the boat. And as long as you've done your diligence and you've kept that boat maintained and you're maintaining it along the way and you're hitting all those, all those maintenance intervals, the boat can take it more than you can. You're the software. You're going to break. You're going to slow down. I like it. Now you, you mentioned that um, a lot of parallels between what you just described and through hiking. I mean, the grit, the tenacity, the the long days, the sleep deprivation, just the endurance mm -hmm. involved, and you've got nowhere to go. I mean, no. typically uh, in many places on a through hike, you're out in the middle of nowhere. And you on a, on a ship going across the Pacific, you're out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you end up in spaces where you're closer to the International Space Station than you are to the nearest land or the nearest that is, human. That is wild. That is, and you, you get to these places pretty quick. And once you're 200 miles offshore, is where you're usually past where a rescue helicopter can get you. So that's you've kind of entered this like red zone. Once you're there, and then once you're, you know, 1500 miles offshore, you're in the middle of an ocean. There's there's nothing around. You're just, you're you're totally free, but you're totally exposed. You know, you're always you're inches from kind of going from wet to dead out there. So you end up in this interesting space where you're you're always you're tuned in, like you're aware, you're you're very part of every creek, every line, every wave, every puff of wind. You're just you're, you're totally in the moment, and then you're in that moment for weeks at a time. So it's it's this really special place that's that's hard to get from anything else, you know. And that's where I think long distance running, hiking, sailing are the the few things left where you can we can sit from a place of comfort. You know, you can sit on the couch and go. You know, this adventure sounds great. <laughs> and then you have to actually go and get out there to really experience the hardship of that adventure and the reward that you get from it. It's they're really transformative experiences. And it's, you know, I think for anybody that has an able body and is thinking of doing one of these things, you know, a hike or a sail or a climb, you'll always come back a bigger, better, more humble person. Yeah, the way you explained it earlier, um, I, I can see very easily how this is so similar that, you know, a marathon runner, when he toes that, that line, the start line, the the through hiker who is standing now at the Mexican border and looking towards Canada before taking that first step and you being in the boat pointing at the pointed at the horizon. I mean, those are all similar, got to be similar feelings of, OK, we're going to go through a lot. We we are going out in into uncharted waters. Hey, that's that's an appropriate yeah. metaphor. They're uncharted waters, and uh, this is going to be something. It's that that moment just before starting, you know, months and months of preparation and saving and organizing your life, and a bit of hardship to to get to that point. That the feeling you have when you're just about to sit on it on that adventure is, it's absolutely incredible, and then. If you're going away from so much comfort and so much we've really gotten used to in our society, you know, cell phones, high speed internet, all this stuff. And you're putting yourself out there in a place of kind of quiet and peace where you can really experience these things. 
ah, it's, yeah, it's a great way to live. All right. Now, which section of this race did you do? You didn't do the whole round the world race. It was just a section across the Pacific. Yeah, it was, so we, I was part of the section we went from New Zealand across to Tahiti. So we, we kind of started in New Zealand. We dipped south to catch some of the southern ocean wind. And as soon as we got it far enough across, we basically headed straight up to Tahiti from there. Because with these, with big ocean currents and big ocean winds, the most direct route isn't always the fastest. You're playing a game between what might be the most direct route and has some pretty unfavorable wind conditions between a longer route that has consistent heavy winds and heavy waves pushing you in the right direction. Now, how did you get selected for this? I mean, did you have to submit a resume that showed that you've been in competitive sailing since you were 13 and you did these loops around the uh, the buoys? Uh, just a friend called me up. <laughs> I was sitting in an office in Toronto working for a mining company, you know, staring out the window, kind of loosely planning what my next adventure would be on the high seas. And I get a phone call and they say, hey, can you come take part in this race? So sure enough, I submitted my resignation and sold everything in my apartment and went and jumped on a boat. And, and it's, what was, what was the lead time that you had for that? I had about three weeks lead time. Okay. But it's, I think that's not a move that surprises my friends and family anymore. It's, I have such a passion and appreciation for sailboats and the amazing community of strange sailor nerds <laughs> that's in that world you know if i'm ever given an opportunity to to learn more to, to sail a faster boat to sail with new people always jump on that and you know, i kind of i wake up in the morning and i go to work so i can do these things and plan these things be part of them now rob what is a kite surf adventure boat Ooh, a kite surf adventure boat in my case would be a catamaran that's outfitted with a bunch of kite boards and kites that's set up to sail around the Southern Caribbean and take paid guests, mostly from Europe, around to some of the most beautiful, pristine kiteboarding locations on the planet. And I, I was fortunate enough to do that for a season. So I spent uh, a number of years working on and off as a yacht captain. And anything with the wind and the water is something that I'm always diving straight into. So that kind of married my um, my skills, I guess. I'm a mediocre kite surfer, but that and my sailing ability and on my captain's licenses kind of came together there to do this for a season. Right. It was great. We we go we go from Martinique um, all the way down to like through the Southern Islands. Oh wow, it's been a few minutes. Uh, we go like Martinique, Saint Martin, Saint Lucia, and then into the Grenadines and cruise through those islands and kind of like a 10 day rotation. So it's doing a lot of miles every 10 days. You run a group through taking all these beautiful spots, get your favorite pubs, come back up, grab the next group and uh, just keep at it. It was, how big was the catamaran? Uh, this was about 60 feet. And was there sleeping quarters on it? Yeah. Sleeping quarters on it. So a 60 foot catamaran, this one had six berths in it. A catamaran is quite wide. You get like a 40 foot wide catamaran and this one is like 38 feet of beam. So you'll, you'll get decent state rooms. So each one will have its own queen bed, its own washroom, its own wardrobe. And then the crew, which is just two of us running this, uh, a chef and a skipper would sleep in these little kind of cabins tucked in each bow. You know, we, we refer to them as the skipper coffin. <laughs> you don't get, you don't get much space for you and your things, but, you know, as soon as you crack that hatch in the morning, you're greeted by a Caribbean sunrise. You know, on the and, pirate ships, the captain's quarters, those were those were the best quarters, the biggest, you know, biggest room on, on the ship. I mean, this doesn't sound very, uh, very dignified for you. The good old days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've just jammed us up front now in these tiny little things, but it's, it's what we got to do to get paying guests on, cut the operational cost of the boat. Uh, if you're contracted to a boat as a as a charter captain for longer periods of time or for a more established boat then usually you just take one of the guest rooms um, so if it's kind of a 65 foot and under you'll run that with two people 
a chef and a captain, and then you'll just split one of the guest rooms. So you'll take the one with like a king bed in the back and you get very friendly with your chef. And it's, you know, you just, you live that life. It's a lot of work. It's, it's really, really involved. You know, you're running a hotel that you can never leave that's trying to sink. So, and you bring people onto this boat for these adventures and people seem to give up all sensibility when they step onto a boat. So all of a sudden they forget how to do things. And that's put simple things away, um, you know, swim in some cases, because they're always looking to the authority figure for, okay, am I allowed to do this? Can I do this? So you're, you're managing a lot of people and a lot of time, but you choose your, you choose your partner, right. And, and who you run the boat with. And it's just a fun adventure. Yeah. They, they step onto the ship and, and or step onto the boat and it's let the good times roll and the support staff, the extensive support staff will, will help manage and clean up things. You know, yeah. But it's, it's all about how and, you, yeah. Oh yeah. We, we take care of everything. Uh, but it's, I find it's all about how you establish your relationship with them in the first 30 minutes. You know, you need to establish dominance and you know, you've done it right. If they ask you if they can get a beer from the fridge and that's when you're like, okay, I got them right where I want them. Cause, Cause you need them to ask you to do things. So things don't break and fall apart. All right now kite surfing, that's where you're on a board and you're holding on to uh, basically a kite and that's, that's pulling you across the water. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a C-shaped parachute. It acts as a bit of a wing. You can do it on a surfboard or a wakeboard type thing. Um, this does add a whole element to keeping charter guests alive. <laughs> uh, you know, before we go out, we'd give everyone this little questionnaire. You know, what's your skill level? You know, what conditions are you comfortable in? And everyone is, you know, Red Bull athlete level. Until you get them out there and all of a sudden they're getting dragged across a reef and one guy's stuck in a palm tree and you're going, okay, who do we say first? <laughs> it's, it's chaos. Um, it's hilarious chaos. But yes, kite, kiting is being dragged around by the wind. And if you manage the kite and the safety systems and if you've kind of learned in an incremental fashion, it's a really safe and fun sport. But if you just go out there with the mentality of, oh, I'll figure this out, you're usually being dragged across the beach into some cliff pretty quick. You make it sound so appealing. I know. Well, I, that's that's how I learned. I bought one off Craigslist, Reality. the cheapest one I could find. Yep, strapped myself into it and soon found myself dragged down the beach. <laughs> now, before we leave the high seas behind, was there ever mm. a time, or you, can you narrow down one of the many times where you were out there and you, and you were thinking to yourself, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to make it here. I don't, I've never, I've never had that thought process. Really? Wow. Never. I've, I've never been in a situation where I've panicked because all you can do is approach things logically. If something explodes or something falls off, something catches on fire, all you can do is start to solve the problem. Otherwise you'll just panic. And it's, it's you have to have that mindset in order to be able to get across an ocean. Okay. Yeah, Let me ask the, it a different way. Was there ever a time where something caught on fire or exploded out in the middle of nowhere on the high seas? I think the most alarming I've had happen is a sail kind of exploding um, a little too close to the center of a hurricane than I would have wanted. Uh, for this passage we we're doing, it's called the Marconi Transat. It's from Newfoundland straight across to England. And we did this in the winter kind of heavy seas we waited for a good storm system and we were pushing across into it and i was doing the navigation for this passage um and there was a second storm system south of the the big low pressure system and it fortunately the two had combined and stalled and we, you know, we were hoping to duck under one and somehow we just ended up smack in the middle of a big one and i think just not paying enough attention. All of a sudden, there was way too much pressure on the mainsail. The thing exploded. It, it ripped off the halyard and ripped a bunch of the carts off the mast that hold it on and woke up out of a deep sleep to just flapping and smashing. And that's I, that's where I had my first moment of, oh, man, there's there's a big problem that needs fixing, and I don't know if, if I can do it. Uh, but lucky enough, this, this was my first passage with 
this amazing experienced captain. And at night, it's picture like a stealth mode submarine. You know, everything's red, got those red lights on. And I just kind of come stumbling through the companion way, putting my stuff on. And this, this like grizzled old sailor just looks at me and, you know, it's an adventure now. Put on the tea. <laughs> that was it. His solution to it was come down, take a moment, make a cup of tea and make a plan. Because anything you do, the quick response in this is probably just going to cause an issue. And it's it it's this great piece of advice that I got from that that situation that I've kind of taken into everything. Let's just put the kettle on. You know, the boat's pitched on its side, it's getting smashed over by a squall. There's nothing you can do in that moment. Um, you know, you loosen the sails and make a cup of tea. Wait it out, kind of come up with a solution. And our solution was, you know, eventually we figured it out. We went up there. We wrestled this flailing massive sail from 110 foot mast down onto the boom, lashed it up, got the storm sail out, and it took us probably an extra 15 days to get to England at that point because um, we just had to limp there. And the most terrifying part of that journey was when we ran in, we ran out of candy, and there was this moment we were looking at our last two gummy worms, going, "Oh man, this is it." <laughs> We still had other rations, but those cheap sugar calories, like they just desperate, keep you going. Desperate times right there, my friend. Desperate times. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but that, you run out of Haribo it, and that that has got a that's got a lot of good transferability uh to, to real life. It when everything is going wrong, have some tea, make a plan, you'll get yeah. through it. Yeah. I mean, I've been really fortunate with the sailors that I've been able to learn from and have taken some inspiration from. And it's 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 a great space where you can really kind of find mentors and say, you know, I want to learn more about this. And a lot of them will, 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 will take you under their wing and show you how that this guy had me on his boat for a year and a half. This was the retired Volvo ocean race boat that was set up to do race charters. So people would want the experience of being on a Volvo ocean race boat and they'd come on to one that had a few paid crew to kind of guide them through that process and be able to just start touching on some of those speeds and experiences. But this was a guy I looked up on the internet, you know, Canadian ocean sailing, um, and just reached out. And the, the, in, the industry is full of people like that, and especially on the racing side, because um, the people who do it love it. And they want to keep the sport alive because it's such a niche sport and part of the industry. Okay. Now, Rob, we're running out of time. We have a number of things that I'd love to talk about, but I'm, I'm going to make you pick. I'm going to make you All pick right. between dog smuggling in Mecca and Alaska <laughs> and the Grizzlies. So your choice, sir. Well, they both involve four-legged creatures. Um, let's go, let's go dog smuggling. Okay. What are my so favorite tell me, tell me about dog smuggling in Mecca. What the heck's going on there? Well, there was a couple of years where I was living and working out of Bedouin communities in southern Saudi Arabia, Hang looking on. for gold. Rob, Rob yeah. we, we've already talked about so many things that you've done, so many wide, disparate types of activities. You you were also living among the Bedouins. I mean, what, what have you not done? Would probably be a shorter list. Oh, I'm not good at Scrabble. <laughs> There's still... There's a lot I haven't done, but um, I'm I'm always very open to new places and opportunities and kind of ways to take a look at our world. E evidently, evidently. So tell us about yeah. about living amongst the Bedouins in Saudi Arabia. Well, I I pay the bills when I'm not sailing, working as a geologist, and my specialty in geology is being an exploration geologist focused on gold. So consortiums of investors or private money, sometimes bigger mining companies will hire myself to go out and kick the tires on a region. So, you know, is there anything out there? And you go through the process of gathering data and old maps and planning an expedition and then going out there, looking at the rocks, wandering around the desert. This is what had taken us to Saudi Arabia. And I was out there on my own, um, close to Jazan in the south of southern saudi arabia working for a consortium of princes who wanted to know do we have gold in this region you know maybe we should invest in mining and they've got a it's really oil-based economy there so they've kind of they're, they're taking a new 
turning a new leaf, as you can say, and they're starting to invest in hard minerals and mining and renewable energy as they kind of see the end of the oil era coming. So this was kind of a first push at that. But down there, these villages are like really small, really rustic. You know, a lot of the people are still following the herds with a nomadic lifestyle living in the desert. So it's always an interesting interaction when you're you've got your pack on, you're hiking through the desert, 50 degree heat with your head wrap on, and you come across a Bedouin camp and they look at you like, what is this alien doing here? You know, it'd be like if you were hiking the PCT and somebody in like full Saudi garb and a head wrap just kind of walked out of the forest with a smile on, you'd have a moment and go, what on earth is going on here? Um, so in, in one of those instances, I came across a dog and there's this uh, big Bedouin settlement and it, they don't treat dogs the same way we do because they don't look at them the same way we do. They're, they're kind of, they're cockroaches, they're rats. There's something you don't want inside your perimeter, inside your house, around your family. And it's they're usually covered in fleas. And I can attest to that because I got fleas a number of times for taking care of the dogs. <laughs> Um, but there was this, this poor little pup who, the, the mom was dead. She was there. Um, nobody was taking care of the pup. You know, some of the kids were kind of kicking stones at her. Um, so I just, you know, grabbed this pup. And, yeah, okay, you're coming with me. So over the next two years, me and this dog just ran around the desert. Yeah. And my job was rip that land cruiser as far into the dunes as he can, hit it in park and take off hiking. And I'd have you know, mapped out a series of outcrops that I wanted to hit through throughout the day and, you know, walk out to them. It was just me and this dog cruising around. And that was the when these Bedouin would come over on the camels just kind of giggling at us. You know, my Arabic is barely passable. And then the local dialect is really hard to understand. But the language was always Marlboro cigarettes. I don't smoke, but I'd always have a pack of Marlboro Reds. And somebody would come over on a camel, they'd kind of be looking at you, they'd start giggling. You know, I'd break out a Marlboro cigarette. All of a sudden, they jump off the camel. I jump on. We'd have this kind of back and forth of just pointing and laughing and then carry on our way through the desert. And this dog was with me every step of the way in this place where yeah, I was alone in times where it would get lonely. But all of a sudden, you have this, this partner in crime. Yeah, it was fantastic. She was drinking camel's milk and you know, eating all kinds of great Arabian food. But it got to the point where I was leaving Saudi. Um, the project was ending because the war with between Saudi and Yemen was kicking off. And we were in this region, which was a pretty hot zone on the border. And there was a couple of military bases north of me, and they were trying to attack those. So when you're sitting there with that cup of tea, watching a missile go over, you're going, okay, I think we'll go home now. But realizing that I had to go and that this dog was, I think, a bit soft for the wild at this point, you know, being hand fed. And I was, you know, head over heels in love with this creature, I had to get her to Canada. But the process doesn't really exist for taking a wild dog out of the desert to Canada in the in the Saudi bureaucracy. So I had to get her to the main city where I was flying out of Jeddah and then get her all the paperwork and get her to fly out within about a 48 hour period. So we didn't have a lot of time to work with. So the quickest way there it's through the holy city of Mecca. Now, there's a perimeter highway which goes around for all the heathens, but that, you know, that's hours of extra time. There's like, no way we're going to do that. So I had this amazing translator with me, Muhammad Abrahim. Guy's an absolute legend. I had a really big beard and a dark tan, and I just kind of pretended I was a Palestinian dignitary. And he's driving this Land Cruiser, you know, like, like this like big Sudanese guy, big beard. We get to Mecca, armed guards, AK-47s. I had given the dog the only thing I had to keep quiet, which was melatonin, and stuffed her in a laundry hamper. And just sitting there like, oh, don't make a sound, don't make a sound, because dogs can't enter the holy city. It's just, it's absolutely forbidden. So at this point, if the dog was caught, if we were caught, there probably would have been some serious consequences. And the security guards started asking for paperwork and delaying, and all of a sudden, you know, Muhammad Abrahim pipes up. He goes, "Do you know who this is? Do you know what kind of timeline we're on?" He's wearing his, his you know, his gold Ray Bans. <laughs> the guy just pipes up the AK for us. Oh, sorry, sir. Very sorry, sir. And waves us right through. So we were able to get the dog through Mecca 
to Jeddah to where we had to get paperwork to get her exported from the country. And Saudi is this place where all the government buildings are in a row down one street. And it stops with the Ministry of Oil. It starts with the Ministry of Oil and Petroleum, which is this very opulent building. You know, lots of marble and beautiful stained glass. It's gorgeous. And then as you go down the street, it kind of goes from pavement to dirt roads and the buildings start falling apart a little bit to where there's the, the Ministry of Agriculture way at the end. And that's where we had to get the paperwork for her for export permits. And the only real animals that are moving through there are prized animals that are bought and sold by princes and royal families. So you walk in and it's, you know, some pretty looking camel and an eagle. I walk into this guy's office holding this dog who's got to get me the paperwork. And it's all kinds of, it's like a strange scene from a scary movie where you've got all these jars of formaldehyde, different critters preserved in them. And I'm going, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> like, just picturing her in one of the jars. But after a bunch of negotiating and a bit of yelling, found his boss and his boss and his boss. Just here's a bunch of cash. I need the paperwork. So got the paperwork from there, went to a couple other places, got a few fake certificates for this and that. And before you know it, she was getting off the plane into minus 20 degrees and snow in Canada. She probably didn't know what the heck hit her. Going from from uh, fifty yeah. degrees Celsius to now snow and and uh, ice. Oh, it was a wild transition, and she was still a very wild dog from a very wild line of dogs. You know, the best we can think is she's a Saluki, which the ancient Israelites used for herding the goats and cattle and protecting them, and they've just been running wild for fifteen hundred years. So to go from that to living in a major city was a bit of a transition. It's like okay, you can't bite everyone and. Can't bark at that. <laughs> it was uh, a pretty wild ride. Rob, do you still have her? Uh, yeah, Kaya, Rocky, Falafel, McFurry face. Um, wow. One of my great sailing friends, his parents have a huge farm in North Carolina. So she's running around North Carolina on this big, beautiful farm with a bunch of other dogs. The only complaint is she eats the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is amazing, and I am so glad that had a had a happy ending. I wasn't sure where you're going, but uh, we got there finally. No, yeah, she she got good it. Stuff. She's in a good place. Nice. Hey, Rob, you know where we are? Life advice. Oh, look at you! Yes, yeah. tip inside of the week. That's right, life advice, otherwise known as the pro tip inside of the week uh, here on the podcast. That's where you get to share some some outdoor adventure wisdom with our listeners. What do you have for us? Oh man, just, just get out there. Whether it's sailing across an ocean, hiking across the country, taking a new class, you know, maybe talking to a new person, all of these things can scare you and give you a space to grow and do something new. But if we, if we start resisting that kind of discomfort, then we become stagnant, you know, and you don't have these moments that make life beautiful. You know, these moments with a bit of adrenaline and excitement, however you can find to generate those, those things, get out there and do it. Because these are the things that you're going to look back on one day. You know, when I can't walk one day, one day when we're all old, wondering what happened, you know, you always remember these beautiful moments that had that excitement and that adrenaline, you know, your mind grabs onto these things for learning experiences and we can cultivate those. So whatever that thing is, my advice would be go do it. That is excellent advice. I want to uh, congratulate you on, on taking that chance and uh, going on the, the John freaking mirror pod uh, for this interview. <laughs> this is a nice memory for you in your old age. So congratulations. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. This is really exciting. And it's a, it's an interesting space, kind of a nervous space to talk about things. Uh, kind of like a, somewhere between a first date and an interview. <laughs> nice. All right. So there you have it. That's it. This episode is just about in the books. Hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Jackie Chan. I want to thank him for joining us this week. <laughs> Rob, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media? And where can they find updates on your latest adventures? I spastically post things on Instagram, uh, and that's at rob.phillips. It's R, the number zero, 
B. Phillips. Is that symbolic? No, somebody just took the letter O. <laughs> <laughs> just working with what I got. Very, very innovative. You you sat down, you, you found out that that name was taken. You had some tea, you made a plan. You came up with yeah. R0B. Got it. Hard work and dedication. Nice. Pays off. All right. Hey, remember to check out the pod on social media as well. We are on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you have comments or clips you want to share, you can send it to me at johnfreakymir at gmail.com. The Adventure Media Recommendation. Rob, I'm also looking to you to share a recommendation for a book, a movie, documentary, some kind of uh, adventure media to keep our listeners connected to the trail or to the high seas during the off season. Uh, what do you have for us? Call this our adventure media recommendation. Oh my gosh. I'm going to have to use a bit of internet because it's slipping my mind right now, but there's this amazing book written on cobalt extraction in the DRC by an investigative journalist. And um, I think it really highlights and harmonizes some of the things that I think about in terms of mineral extraction, which I'm involved in any day, where we get our minerals, what we put them in and how those kind of affect our planet and the people on it. I'm still on. Yeah. If I would have <laughs> woke up this morning and you would have told me that we'd be talking about a book about cobalt extraction, um, I, I would have I would have seriously doubted you. But here we are. So the book's called Cobalt Red by Siddharth Kara. And he's an investigative journalist that went and spent time in the Congo working in these camps um, where Congo is traditionally extracted. But 80% of the cobalt we use in industry, which goes into batteries, phones, computers, comes from the Congo in a region that's totally unregulated, often run by warlords, kind of think blood diamonds. Um, so this guy goes in and spend time, spends time investigating this and really writing about some of the, the tragedies and the families and the people that, that are affected by it. And it's, it's an adventure because um, geology is always an adventure. It takes you to some of the most remote places in the world, but you really get to engage with the geopolitics of what we as a Western society kind of push and pull on. So that this book is a way to kind of dip your toes in that water. Rob, I don't, I don't know about our listeners, but you have really changed my mind about, uh, you know, what geology or a geologist is all about. Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty, you know, maybe a dull type of uh, profession, but obviously not. It's a wonderful space. There's, there's the scientific side of it, and I'm by no means a good scientist. Um, you know, I, I, I got through school somehow after being introduced to geology by a guy in a bar. It just said you might like this and found this really cool side of it that's exploration geology and that's going into the remote most remote places on the planet to look for the minerals that we, we use to drive our society and our economy forward and some of those are in a clean way some of those are in a dirty way where you can go from coal that you know we're burning all over the world emitting a ton of greenhouse gases to lithium which we're using to produce batteries to go into some of these cleaner more efficient technologies we're using but that stuff's deep in the Amazon, high in the Arctic, in the middle of the African jungle. And somebody that knows about the rocks has got to get out there and figure it out and engage with the communities, the environment, and all that wonderful stuff. So Fantastic. Yeah, if you want to go walk off the map and into undocumented communities, rocks could be a good ticket to get there. Sign me up. Sign me up. What have we not asked you? I don't think that's a Canadian accent in that uh, that intro. <laughs> but uh, before we wrap things up, one more segment for you called "What Have I Not Asked You That You're Dying to Tell Us About." Oh, I don't know. We've covered so many topics. Um, I've recently got really into skydiving, and I've recently been reading about the idea of chronoception, how we can make our life longer through having new experiences. I think Scott Adams ties into. Yeah, it's the it sounds like a sounds perception. like a movie with a, a spinning top at the end. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the discount version of Inception. <laughs> it's much shorter. <laughs> uh, but it's this idea that um, you know we all have a perception of time in one way or another, 
and they've they really looked at this through studies where um, lab rats through positive reinforcement are really good at detecting 40 second intervals, like really, really good. But as soon as you introduce excitement or dopamine to the situation, that kind of gets messed up. And it kind of makes sense how our perception of time is messed up or changed in environments where we're excited. You know, if you look back to when we're hunter gatherers, you know, you're on a hunt, it goes good or it goes wrong. There's adrenaline, there's dopamine, there's all these synapses firing in your brain. You're going to take note of that for the next time. You know, it's your brain taking more careful notes as opposed to those six months you didn't do anything for. But when you when you look back on those things, these moments are longer, kind of like, you know, the glory days. But those glory days don't have to end if you can find a way to cultivate and create these moments in time that kind of sit like a weight, a bowling ball on this sheet of time. And I think with the idea of chronoception, that we can take an active role in making our lives perceive longer by having creating these new experiences where we scare the shit out of ourselves and that could just be going and talking to that girl or guy or jumping out of a plane which i started doing recently sailing across oceans but that's I mean, that's the one thing i've been obsessing over lately you can get more out of life by by cultivating it you know, I thought I was just reaching out to uh, some simple deckhand on a on a mega yacht, <laughs> but I, I have gotten so much more than that. I am so glad that I I reached out to you and that you you said yes. So that's fantastic, Rob. Thank you so much. Well, that is a wrap from the John Freaky Mirror Studio. Any shout outs to friends and family, Rob? All of them. Um, to all my dirty pirate friends out there, keep at it. Keep living that life. And to everybody out there who's you know, on that grind, trying that new thing, you know, I love you and keep at it because people like you make this world a lot more fun. Okay. Thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if it's almost <laughs> for a campsite. It doesn't even care if you're the victim of a wild puffin attack. The trail is the trail. Embrace. Hey, the man, brother. Thank you.